Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Ham Nation is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This episode of Ham Nation is brought to you by ICOM. For more information, visit icomamerica.com slash ham nation. This is Ham Nation, episode number 315 for August 30th, 2017. Ham Radio and Hurricane Harvey. Hey, good evening, everybody. It is Wednesday night, 8 p.m. Right here on most of this very computer or smartphone or other device or shortwave radio station, if you happen to be listening via WTWW 5085 and 12.105. Uh, You can email them, by the way, email at WTWW.us for uh, anything ham radio related. Just send them a call or send them an email. It's Ham Nation time here on uh, the uh, the Mighty Twit Network. My name's Don. We've got uh, the usual uh, cast of suspects tonight with the exception of Bob. Bob is out doing Bob stuff. Actually, it was um, yesterday, I believe, was... um, Was it yesterday or the day before? was Sarah's birthday, so they're out doing that kind of stuff. Anyway, tonight we are going to – we'll talk to everybody here in just a sec, but I wanted to bring you up to date on uh, Hurricane Harvey. Hurricane Harvey has moved into central Louisiana. Now, if we can pull up that Fort Polk radar, Vic, we'll show you just exactly where Hurricane Harvey is now, and you can see it in motion. Uh, So it is up uh, center of circulation it's a tropical storm now, uh, center of circulation right around Alexandria, Fort Polk. And uh, if you go to the New Orleans radar, you can see that it really is a non-issue for New Orleans and for Jackson. Just some rain bands, and that's about it. We're on the dry side of it now, so it uh, has not affected New Orleans, which was we're very thankful for because, again, as I said, yesterday was the 12th anniversary of, uh, of Katrina. And we've had some serious, serious infrastructure uh, issues with drainage where basically just a hard rain will cause the streets to flood. So we did not need that. And, of course, Houston did not need that either. Um, Hurricane Harvey is the new benchmark. It dropped twice the amount of rain over Houston that Katrina did. Uh, I think Katrina dropped uh, four billion gallons, I think. And they're way over 10 billion or maybe 12 billion gallons of rain uh, for Harvey over Houston. So, my God, uh, the folks over in Texas, please keep them in your prayers. Uh, If you want to make an immediate donation to the Red Cross, you can do that by texting Harvey to 90999. That will be a $10 donation on your uh, your smartphone. Just go ahead and text that over and that uh, that goes directly to them. There are other ways, Salvation Army as well. And we're going to talk more about uh, everything hurricane related because that's what we're dealing with tonight. But first, let's go around the room and see who we have. We have to uh, to my north there, right above me, of course, is uh, George up in Jackson. No rain up there, I don't guess, uh, quite yet, huh, George? You're going to get some bands, but probably nothing bad. Uh, we, we've had some bands throughout the day. Not really that bad. We had a tornado watch all afternoon, but it didn't look to me like uh, there was really any reason for concern with that this time around. So relatively unscathed here. However, my son lives in the Houston, uh, Texas area. He doesn't live right in Houston. He lives in one of the suburbs. Uh, the night before the storm, they went to stay at a friend's house who had a 50 kW generator, thinking, well, if we lose electricity, um, you know, we'll be good. Um, then the hurricane came. And his, my son's house was okay. He talked to his neighbor. Uh, no flooding right in his neighborhood. However, all the streets were closed, so he couldn't get home till last night about midnight. So uh, thanks to his friend there for taking care of them through it. And uh, boy, what a tough situation over there. Yeah, it really is. But the, the main thing is they're okay, right? Because you got a brand, oh, yeah. new, uh, brand new grandbaby over there, right? I do. I got uh, got three grandsons over there. So uh, working wow. on a big crowd in Texas. 
Good. Well, I'm glad uh, I'm glad everything is OK over there. We will uh, come back and check with George a little bit later on. But look, we have Amanda with us tonight. Uh, she's at the head of the show because we are going to talk with her and a guest coming up a little bit. How are things uh, over in uh, over in Colorado? You don't have to deal with any of this, any of this nonsense. Absolutely not. The only thing I ever deal with is um, reading about this, and that's hard enough. So, uh, again, prayers to out there in Texas. Texas proud right here. Hello. Yeah, All I right. see it. Over, looks great. <laughs> over to you, Dan. All right, looks great. And now over to uh, Costa Mesa, where uh, they sleep out every night. It's uh, it's Gordon West. How are you tonight, Gordon? Uh, tell us what's going on over there and uh, give us your short shots. All right, uh, Don. All is well in Costa Mesa. Mighty hot, and we are thinking of all of you in uh, Houston, and uh, you have our prayers and our hopes for a speedy recovery. And uh, we're recovering after 2,000 miles for a 152nd shot at the total solar eclipse. Now, this was a radio event, three quarter of a million spots on the reverse beacon network, a half million spots on the PSK automatic propagation recorder, and a ton of hams heading for totality, racking up thousands of miles. And let me tell you, it was worth it. And by the way, this weekend is Shelby. And we hope many of you will attend the Shelby Ham Fest over the Labor Day weekend. It's fun. So, Victor, if you'll go ahead and let's take a look at the short shots for 2,000 miles for 150 seconds of high volume traffic expected. As we came into the Idaho area, the Idaho Aries and Racy's members were right on top of it. All of the link repeaters on two meters and 440 were carrying traffic reports. And that's Tracy driving uh, the big uh, Winnie and Jody, Tracy WM6T, Jody WA6JL, and their uh, Tesla, their uh, new dog in the Winnie towing the uh, Jeep. And we ran into no traffic. And that was thanks to the Aries and the Racy's members that were right on top of things. Here we are pulling into the 7 in North campground. Let me tell you, this was a secluded campground where we were assured there'd be uh, no bright lights during the day or night, especially during totality. And, you know, it's been some time since the USA has uh, observed totality, but the hams were well prepared. And thanks to the interview last week with Ward Silver, gave us a great idea, even before it, with his articles in Nuts and Bolts magazine, on what to tune in and to favor the lower bands because it's the lower ham radio bands and the lower frequencies below 5 megahertz that will jump into action as if it were nighttime during totality. So we have our solar panels out to getting the last of the sunshine. That's a flat panel direct TV uh, antenna. Uh, not many flat panels out there. Did a great job. Susie did the driving and I did the yakking on the radio. And that's Tracy. And uh, Tracy, WM6T, uh, had his Ellie Craft radios all tuned out. Oh, yeah, he's got ICOMs as well. And uh, he was quite happy because there was no noise at this uh, remote uh, campground right at the center of totality. Um, Tracy ran several different antennas for his different uh, checks of propagation. Uh, one was the Outbacker antenna, and that's the one, if you talked with me when we were mobile HF, the Outbacker, although it's no longer sold in the USA, is quite a performer. But you're probably looking at that antenna going, where's the ground? Well, we'll tell you in a moment. But our concentration was going to be the disappearing D layer during daylight hours. During daylight hours, that is uh, when uh, uh, usually uh, the uh, shells of atoms of gas, uh, they break out into the O2 and the nitrogen. And uh, when they break out of their shells, they form quite a layer up in the E, sometimes sporadic E clouds, the F1 and the F2 during the day. But it's the darn D layer that absorbs signals, most of them below 10 megahertz. Well, what would happen during totality? And that's what the big ham radio testing was all about. Ham Psy at Virginia Tech was going to look at this phenomena as well. 
So we weren't so much on the higher bands, yet Tracy was there making sure that uh, his signals were heard all over the place during totality as well. There's the ground leads you see on the right-hand side. They're all quarter wavelength, so he had a good working antenna. Oh, no, on Sunday night, look at this. Coming into Idaho, it looks like overcast. We were a bit worried about the prospects of seeing the sun that next morning. Well, the next morning came, and as you can see by the green grass and the smile on Tracy's face, we had propagation and we had bright skies with absolutely uh, nothing to uh, hinder our uh, look at uh, totality. So before totality, we all went out there. That's Tracy and Jody and my Susie, and we're all looking up there. Notice the shortwave receiver. We had several of them on different frequencies. And that little shortwave receiver, one was on 10 megs, one on 5, and one at 2.5. And Amanda out of Colorado knows that that's the Fort Collins WWV. Tracy was monitoring the ham frequencies. And we had tons of folks all around us uh, wanting to know what we were doing with all of these different radios. So it was a great opportunity take some of the onlookers that uh, trudged out here in this huge middle of nowhere to take advantage of uh, radios uh, to see what's going on. Well, these folks didn't have a lot of uh, telescopes and stuff, so we turned a pair of binoculars around and we showed up the image on a, a white piece of paper with a shadow. And about 10:15, uh, there it is, the uh, eclipse began. And uh, there was no change in 10 megahertz, but WWV, 450 miles away on uh, 5 megahertz and 2.5, nothing but static. So we kept listening, going, I wonder what's going to happen. Again, 10 megahertz, no change. Even during totality, 10 was there, rock solid. But would we hear 5 and 2.5, hundreds of miles away? As we got closer to totality, the HF bands down low, 160 meters and 75 meters and 40 meters, began to do different things, and that is they came alive. Tracy watching the spectrum analyzer, we saw activity. We had radios tuned to KFI 640, KSL Salt Lake 660, KOMO Seattle, and KOA Denver, and none of them appeared as we were hoping they were appearing during totality. And as you can see, we're about 80% of totality. Things then began to grow silver. And as you saw last week, uh, we saw images of the sun as uh, little half specks here in leaves leaving shadows. It was quite interesting. And um, then things began to turn more silver. We were all prepared for midnight where we couldn't see anything. So we were ready. All of our shortwave radio is going. But still, no change on 5 megahertz and no change at 2.5. Then, as totality hit, the 5 megahertz band began to come in from WWV, about 450 miles away from us. A small little loop antenna like this does a surprising job on the lower HF band. So we had everything tuned in and bango, totality. Well, we... Uh, started listening to uh, 5 megahertz, and then during totality, um, it got dark, but everybody says it's going to be black. No, it wasn't black. We could still see across the field, but it was pretty dark. And totality was like instant. On the uh, Elecraft, um, signals on the lower frequencies popped out of nowhere, and on our CC radio, our AM radio, we did pick up KOA in Denver, at least we think it was, it was on the correct frequency. So, uh, Amanda, we were tuning you in on a band that normally only would go a couple hundred miles during the day. So, that shortwave receiver worked out. During totality, uh, the sun got more and more impressive to a simple Nikon camera. And what was most amazing are those red spots at 2 o'clock and about uh, 3 or 4 o'clock. Uh, we have all sorts of different views as to what it is. But as we get closer to the end of totality, guess what? 2.5 WWV just comes out of nowhere very, very rapidly and begins to pound in. 
Well, we're now getting out of uh, totality. And uh, just as soon as uh, the bright light of the uh, sun emerging from behind the moon comes up, notice the red marks. And uh, at uh, totality, uh, there was a nearby couple that uh, made an engagement uh, uh, decree to themselves, uh, engagement party along with a diamond ring. So it was impressive. And that's Susie and that's me going thumbs up for a great event. All right, Victor, if you'll come back here. So probably the biggest deal about this whole totality was how it, during totality, 2.5 and 5 megahertz, or 75 meter ham band, began to rise very quickly. After totality, these bands remained open for almost 45 minutes. And that was a big deal. Much like a vessel cruising through a, a still lake, uh, it's sudden where the vessel is creating waves, but the wake went on and on. So for 45 minutes, we were hearing 2.5. We were hearing AM radio station Skywave. And then very slowly, the recombining of the ionosphere, atoms, and electrons began to fade those stations away. So we had some wild propagation, and we uh, really enjoyed it. So again, our best uh, hopes for those of you in Houston. And uh, for those of you attending the Shelby Ham Fest this week, and have fun and uh, wear some sunscreen because hopefully you'll have as much sun as we did. So now let's take a listen at Newsline and also what Dr. T has to say about this whole affair. Here's Newsline with Don. From Amateur Radio Newsline Report number 2078, these are the Ham Nation headlines for Wednesday, August 30th, 2017. We have a recap of our Young Ham of the Year presentation at the Huntsville Ham Fest on our full newscast. And you can listen to the presentation in its entirety as a Newsline Extra on our webpage, arnewsline.org. Meanwhile, India has increased the number of amateur radio operators within its borders. It was a big day for hopeful radio amateurs in Bangladesh on August 19th when more than 250 of them showed up to take the license exam offered by the Bangladesh Telecommunication Regulatory Authority. Now, the waiting begins. Anup Kumar, S21TV of the Bangladesh Amateur Radio League, said in a recent email that the last amateur radio exam had been given in 2013 and was taken by 160 candidates. Of those who took that exam, 147 passed. Good luck to future hams. We'll be listening for you on the air. Newsline's Paul Brown, WD9GCO. Our neighbors to the north are taking a second look at 60 meters. Canadian regulators are seeking comment on the proposed changes on the 60 meter band for amateur use. The review of these regulatory changes is based on proceedings at the 2015 World Radio Communication Conference and would add the International 5351.5 to 5366.5 kHz band to the existing five U.S. compatible channels that were allocated by the Canadian regulator Industry Canada in 2014. George Gorsline, VE3YV, the International Amateur Radio Union's Region 2 Area A Director, told Radio Amateurs of Canada that the responses will be tabulated after a 60-day period, but said there was no schedule or deadline for the changes to be made. In any event, he added, amateur radio regulations would first have to be updated. Industry Canada's own comments include notes that numerous nations have authorized 60-meter usage with restrictions and that no interference has been reported. Its consultation notes also said that the proposed changes would be especially helpful for radio operators responding to disasters at the domestic and international level. For Amateur Radio Newsline, I'm Heather Emby, KB3TZD. If you're heading to a VE session anytime soon, pay attention. There's an updated form to watch for. The National Conference of Volunteer Exam Coordinators, better known as the NCVEC, has updated its unofficial Form 605 that is used at volunteer exam sessions to coincide with the revised FCC Form 605. All exam sessions were required to start using the new version of the form on August 21st in preparation for the FCC deadline of September 7th. The change to the form questions applicants if he or she has been convicted of a felony in any state or federal court. This question has been on other FCC forms and the omission on the form 605 was not previously noticed. 
Applicants that answer yes to the question must provide a statement directly to the FCC concerning the circumstances of the conviction for qualification review. All previous versions of both FCC and NCVEC Form 605 should be discarded. Reporting for Amateur Radio Newsline, I'm Neil Rapp, WB9VPG in Bloomington, Indiana. For the rest of this week's Amateur Radio News, please listen to the full Amateur Radio Newsline report online on a repeater near you or on shortwave radio station WTWW at 9930 and 5085 kilohertz. And that's all from the Amateur Radio Newsline, your independent source for amateur radio news for four decades and counting at www.arnewsline.org. With Paul Brown, WD9GCO, Heather MB, KB3TZD, Neil Rapp, WB9VPG, Karen Eve Murray, KD2GUT at the News Desk in New York, and our news team across the globe. I'm Don Wilbanks, AE5DW73. We'll see you next time here on Ham Nation. Now, here's the solar update with Dr. Tamitha Scove. We're back from the eclipse, but the sun still takes center stage. We have some fast wind and a solar storm that's been launched that's coming our way, as well as a new region that's rotated into Earth view, and it's already firing flares. Those stories and more in the news this week. You'd think that after the solar eclipse, the sun would just take a breather to go, ah, but it's not. There's a huge coronal hole that's going to be rotating into the Earth's strike zone here in the next day or so. On top of that, we have a solar storm that was fired from region 2672. It's launched slightly west of us, but it may go completely west of us with this uh, fast wind that may kind of push it off to the side. It could still enhance storm conditions. It's kind of hard to tell. Meanwhile, we have region 2674 that's now rotating into Earth view, and it's already firing off C-class flares and we're watching it to see if it has any M-flare potential. It's a busy week. Switching to your M-flare threat meter, you can see we actually have been a little bit active. We've been below the seafloor, but we've been popping C-class flares pretty regularly. That's because we've had three different regions on the Earth-facing disk that have been pretty active. Now, we haven't seen any M-class flares as of late, but the most recent region, which is region 2674 that's just now coming into Earth view, it popped this mid-C-class flare here just on the 30th, and we're going to be watching it to see whether or not it's going to be become an M-flare player. Switching to our solar storm conditions, you can see right before the eclipse, we were actually in pretty active conditions. We even bumped up to storm levels for a short while. And personally, I was a little bit concerned that we weren't going to quiet down in time for the eclipse. But then the magic happened. Do you see that little green area right there? It's like God went, shh. And we went to quiet conditions just long enough for the eclipse to happen, and all the scientists and projects like hamsci.org were able to get their science done, and then as soon as it was over, bam, we went back up to active conditions for a while. Now things are beginning to settle down. We are in quiet conditions, but it won't last long because we do have that fast wind with that solar storm, and we could be back up to solar storm conditions here in just a little bit. Switching to your solar storm and aurora possibilities over the coming week, we are anticipating the hit from that high-speed wind that should be hitting us here in the next day or so. That should be compounded by that solar storm that's kind of blowing off to our west. At high latitudes, NOAA's giving us a minor storm conditions with maybe about a 30% or more chance for a major storm. At mid-latitudes, we're only looking at minor storm conditions, maybe for the next day or two, and then it should calm back down. We've got about a 5% chance for major Major storm at mid latitudes, so not all that much. This is great news for you, Aurora photographers who haven't seen Aurora in a bit. We actually get a good chance for that. But you amateur radio operators, you may have some issues over the weekend, especially if you're doing some contesting. Switching to your solar flare and particle radiation storm outlook over the coming week, we now have three active regions in Earth view that are making C-class flares. So NOAA is giving us about a 10% chance from an M-class flare. This is mainly from region 2674. This may actually up a little bit in the next few days, depending upon what that region does. Now, the nice thing about this is that we've got solar flux levels that are increasing. So we should get better propagation on the bands, even though it probably will be a bit noisy this week. So even though the eclipse is over, the sun is still hard at work. We have that fast wind that's going to be hitting us here in the next day or so. That's going to be compounded by that solar storm that launched slightly to the west of us. This should bring us some decent aurora, so you aurora photographers get your shutter fingers ready. 
Now, you amateur radio operators, you're having to deal with three active regions on the Earth-facing disk right now that are producing C-class flares. There's not really a chance for radio blackouts at this point, but it's a minor chance. But most likely, it's just going to be noisy uh, on the ham bands. The nice thing is that the solar flux is up a bit, so that should give us some decent propagation. Now, you GPS operators, of course, worry a little bit about the Dawn Dust Terminators because that's when you're going to see the biggest problems. I'm Tamitha Scove. Thank you for watching. Thank you, Dr. T. As always, I hope that everyone realizes how fortunate we are to have her on our team. My Lord, just the best. Tamitha Scove, follow her on Twitter, at Tamitha Scove, by all means, and go to spaceweatherwoman.com to find out what's going on. All right, let's let's uh, let's turn things over to Amanda for a little while here. Amanda's gonna bring us a guest, and Amanda is uh, is the one who set this up. So Amanda, I think it's only fair that you kick off our uh, our interview time here. So uh, Amanda, take it away with your, with our guest tonight. Who do, we, who, who do we have? Well, thank you so much. We actually have Jeff Walter, who is the section emergency coordinator from South Texas joining us this evening. And uh, Jeff, uh, your call sign, I have it, it's KE5FGA, is that correct? Yes, ma'am. Okay, and Jeff's gonna tell us a little bit about, A, first of all, Jeff, tell us, make sure you're safe there in Texas. Where are you located? Uh, let's say, according to, how far away are you from Houston? I would say that I'm about uh, 20 miles from downtown Houston on the west side. If you know where Highway 99 um, mm -hmm goes around on the west side and we are almost at Waller County. It's about uh, one mile from the Waller County line. Okay, and but yes, you and safe. your Yeah, you and your family are safe. Unfortunately, a lot of families around there are not. So tell us what has your your Aries group been doing to to help out? Pretty much we've been on a wait. Uh, this has been a two-part hurricane, one that hit the land down in the uh, south part of Texas uh, with the wind and we got nothing of the wind, and then uh, it turned into a rain event as it moved uh, along the coast. Uh, the, the rain stopped down at where it hit, where the winds were, and then we got all of the rain, and the rain just would not stop. It started raining on, uh, here it started raining on Friday morning at 6.05, and it stopped raining here yesterday afternoon at about uh, 12 o'clock. Okay. And uh, Victor's going to show some pictures here in the background. He's just, you're going to see some hurricane pictures. You don't have to explain anything. Um, so we did see some things from your, one of your emergency coordinators, KE5 CVH, who said they've been yes. working out of this EOC and uh, they had been coordinating some stuff and even possibly putting some people around some launch boats. Um, did anything come of that? I don't know anything about the launch boats. Uh, that is our Harris County Homeland Security Office of Emergency Management uh, in uh, almost in downtown Houston. Uh, okay. Right now, uh, a lot of those folks are setting up over where the Texans play at NRG Stadium. But launch boats, I, I don't know anything about that. Okay, and um, yeah, and you see, this is what happens when we have so much social media, everybody, that you see some Aries people might put out some statements that might not be true on Facebook. So that's why you kind of question it and make sure you follow up. Second thing, obviously, um, you're trying to tell us, do not self-deploy down there to the Houston area or maybe even Port Arthur, is that correct? Uh, that's exactly right. Uh, you may be, some places you may be stopped by, uh, by police. Uh, they won't let anybody in. And uh, other places, uh, they don't want your help. They don't need your help. Uh, at least they don't need it yet. And so we want you to wait until a coordinated effort is is made for resources going into anywhere, including Harris County. Okay, and are you guys manning any of the uh, Red Cross shelters down there? Uh, yes, we are. The initial Red Cross uh, request came for 22 shelters and I think it is up to 93 now. Um, but they're the same way. Uh, the, the, as long as the cell phones work, uh, then they really don't need ham radio operators. Uh, at least that's what they feel because they can talk to everybody with their cell phone. Well, yeah, you can one person at a time. Um, but they would uh, they would like to 
for you to go away and then come back if when it's really busy. Uh, a lot of the shelters that are down in the south part of Texas are not busy right now and, and they're closing up, but they're springing up in Harris County and the counties around Harris County and they even have some, uh, some shelters that are up in around the Dallas area. Understandable. And uh, the one one of the things that I've seen is that right now it might not be an immediate merg- emergency and people might be staying with friends and family. But come a week from now, when those people are tired of them or they just don't have the room or the space or you run out of money for your hotel rooms, what do you do then? Then you start filling in shelters. So it, what's, what's your opinion about that, Jeff? So what will happen is they will open up pods, points of distribution, and they'll pass out um, uh, ice, food, and water. And the, the idea is once the water goes down and they open up these pods, so right now trucks that are full of this stuff, uh, they can't get anywhere because of the roads are flooded. So they have assets uh, sitting all over the county in, in uh, non-flooded areas waiting uh, to be sent to uh, NRG, which is where all of our uh, food, ice, and water will be staged until a pod opens up. And uh, pods uh, will be at uh, very large centers like uh, Uh, football stadiums, uh, high school football stadiums or colleges or something like that. And then they'll send the trucks out there. Uh, By the time all this is organized, hopefully they'll have enough volunteers to staff the pods, enough police, the roads will be clear, and they'll move out of the shelters, move into the pods, and then maybe the stores will restock and open up. uh, Because uh, even our store, uh, just a mile from here, they have nothing. Uh, You go down there, you want a bag of chips, they don't have it. Oh, exactly. Now, Don, we know Don that has been in the same situation, being evacuated and being a ham. Uh, Don, do you have any questions for Jeff at this point in time? I can tell you that I feel for those folks who are in those evacuation shelters. For Katrina, 12 years ago, we spent two weeks. Um, we didn't have to go to a shelter, thankfully. We we had the wherewithal to go to a uh, to a hotel. But nonetheless, we visited uh, some of the shelters and uh, some of the places uh, for Red Cross and FEMA to uh, to get some assistance. And uh, my heart goes out to all of those people up there. Um, I don't really, I don't have any specific questions. I just, uh, Jeff, I just want to thank you and your team for everything that you're doing because as, as one who was displaced 12 years ago, and I got to tell you, this whole week has given me some seriously bad flashbacks. Um, I'm I'm so ready for this to be over, and it looks like it is on its way out now. It's it's right up around uh, central Louisiana now, probably just as a weak tropical storm. But uh, man, just thank you for everything that that you've that you've done and will do and will continue to do because this is going to be a very 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 long recovery process because uh, Katrina is no longer the benchmark. Harvey is now the benchmark. So I have. Uh, uh uh, if if Amanda, are you done with your questions, Amanda? Uh, pretty much. I just, uh, you know, anything else I'd want to follow up with is um, how many people do you have out there that are in the shelters or ready to man the shelters, uh, any of that kind of stuff? I don't have a good count on that. Uh, you can look at the Red Cross website and hover all over each one of the shelters and there is not a good count on the shelters. There's a shelter about a mile away from us. Um, if you hover over the, uh, the shelter, it'll give you a count of zero. We know there are more people there, uh, but uh, our area is not flooded. You can't have a shelter where it's flooded. You have to have it where it's not flooded. Uh, so I, I really don't have a good idea. The, the big place uh, down at uh, George R. Brown downtown, they had over 9,000 uh, evacuees there. Uh, they don't like to call them evacuees. They like to call them guests. Uh, but now they're going to move them out of the GRB and uh, take them uh, take them someplace else as soon as Metro, which is our uh, transportation system, the road's clear enough for them to get on the Metro and, and maybe go down to NRG, which is a much bigger place and uh, can handle them easier. There's no parking downtown. Oh, I can imagine. And if so, they probably charge a fortune and you probably can't get it validated whether you're an evacuee or a guest or not. Um, <laughs> I'm just kidding. Uh, Jeff, uh, you you take the final comments there. You finish it up. Tell us uh, everything else you'd like us to know about what's going down there in South Texas. Uh, so that's true on the parking. It costs $10 to park even if you're a volunteer. Uh, <laughs> so the uh, the three the three things that I would like for, uh, for anyone that does uh, uh, emergency communications, um, we want you to have a plan and have the plan before something happens and stick to the plan. 
And part of that having the plan is to have a backup plan whenever a repeater fails or uh, someone doesn't show up. Uh, whenever your plan fails a little bit, have a backup plan to that plan. Uh, the second thing is, is don't take an assignment that you are not comfortable with. We don't want you to drive through the high water that you're showing the pictures on the screen now. Don't drive through that. Uh, stay home. Uh, that's what we want folks to do now. We want them to stay home until the water recedes because we're not going to replace your truck. Uh, we're not going to replace anything. Uh, you're a volunteer. If you get hurt, uh, you're on your own. Um, and the third thing is don't ever, la don't ever let the lack of equipment stop you from volunteering. There are plenty of jobs. Uh, for folks that are newly licensed or they have a uh, maybe only a, a five watt radio but get with your emergency coordinator and figure out uh, something for you to do uh, you can be uh, logging and you and you have to learn sometime uh, we weren't all born with uh, with all the equipment that we have now uh, you see the uh, icom radio or whatever it was uh, on the desk uh, you acquire that stuff over time. So start out uh, slow and you'll get there over time and uh, help your community. Absolutely. And I, I always try to push, I'm a big Aries person here, huge Aries person. Try to push people, get into those public service roles, do a 5K run, do a 10K run. You know, do any of that stuff to get yourself a little bit coordinated with what's going on in in, in the bigger picture and get yourself prepared. So Jeff, I'd really like to thank you for being here tonight. Um, Don, would you like to say anything else? Uh, just Amanda, great job on the interview. I, you being an Aries person and, and you lining this up, I wanted to give you the shot to, uh, to have this interview and you knocked it out of the park. Jeff, thank you so much for everything that you're doing and will continue to do down there. And uh, all of Texas is in our prayers. And we Absolutely. appreciate uh, we appreciate everything that you and, and all of your, your team are doing down there. You're welcome. I do have a website, though. Uh, so yes, by all means, coming, give it to us. If someone's coming into town because their their family is flooded out um, and, they, and they have their uh, radio equipment and they wonder, well, what frequency are those guys on? Well, if you go to www.arrlstx.org, there's a whole set of FEMA forms there that uh, is updated at least once a day. And there's a frequency list. Uh, uh, if you look on that list, you have the ICS 205. Um, uh, we have a, a plan for, and you can click on any of those links and the stuff will pop right up. Uh, it, it's coordinated. The, uh, the 205, uh, the one for the VHF and UHF repeaters, and then the HF plan. Uh, we have to not just concern ourselves with um, talking regionally we have to or locally we have to concern ourselves with possibly talking regionally so we have a separated local uh, VHF UHF plan and a, a region-wide South Texas region-wide uh, communication plan but stick to the plan awesome Jeff thank you so much again for everything that you're doing thank Amanda you. great job and uh, we, we appreciate you so much Jeff thanks a lot well let's uh, go ahead and get a, a word from ICOM and then we'll come back with George here on Ham Nation. Thank you. Heard it, worked it, logged it. Contest season is here. ICOM's high performance and innovative transceivers will help you make the most out of contest season. Continue your contesting momentum with the IC7300. Ideal for the ham on the go, it's a high performance HF transceiver with a compact design, RF direct sampling, 15 discrete bandpass filters, large 4.3 inch color touchscreen, real time spectrum scope, and SD memory card slot. The IC7851 will give you the competitive edge you've been looking for. Raise the bar and hear what others cannot with this HF 50 MHz transceiver. Reciprocal mixing dynamic range, crystal clear local oscillator design, spectrum scope, dual receivers, and digital voice recorder. And don't forget about the ICOM IC7700 and IC7600 radios. Both of these top-of-the-line transceivers are still available and sure to be the perfect companion for this contesting season. Visit icomamerica.com slash amateur for more information on all the great ICOM radios. And you can tune in and enter to win after each episode of Ham Nation. Go to icomamerica.com slash hamnation. Register to win some great swag prizes like T-shirts and hats, 
While you're there, learn how you could win in the monthly grand prize drawing for a new radio. And for August, that new radio is going to be the ICOM ID4100A dual band entry level D Star Mobile. Does both analog and D Star. It's got big rig features, built in GPS, full dot matrix display, micro SD card slot for voice and data storage. And available Android or iOS applications. So go to icomamerica.com slash hamnation. After this and each episode of Ham Nation, that's icomamerica.com slash hamnation. Register to win, sign up, good luck. And don't forget to follow Icom America Inc. on Facebook and Twitter. And Icom has another contest going too. I want to mention you see this nice radio right here in front of me it's the ic7300 um well it's been around for uh, a little better than a year now it's probably the most popular radio going at this point so we're going to be giving away one of those along with an mfj switching supply small supply there and Heil sound from bob the Heil pro set ic a uh, great headset designed exclusively to work with ICOM radios. And antennas, uh, the MFJ cobweb antenna, that's uh, kind of hot right now. Uh, 100 feet of coax, everything you need for a complete HF station. Go to amateurlogic.tv slash contest and register to win. And uh, you can only register once, but go there, get all the details. It'll tell you how to do it. Uh, and um, thanks, ICOM, MFJ, and Hall Sound for making that possible. And tonight, I've got, well, a little video here of a subject we covered on uh, Ham College, oh, back in Episode 7. It's been a little while now, but I was looking for something for tonight, kind of short and sweet. Here you go. So, let's get this set up here and do some radio wave experimenting. This is a 2000 Hz audio signal that we're looking at right here. It's a sine wave, that little flickering you see, and that's just because we're not triggering correctly on it. But you, you can hear the, the tone there a little bit. Yeah, if I'm we, surprised your dogs aren't howling out there. They could be. <laughs> uh, we can't hear it because we're deaf from listening to the tone. <laughs> As Tommy mentioned earlier, you know, to check a wavelength, you'd measure from the top of one waveform to the top of the next one right there. And uh, that would be your wavelength. The wavelength, yeah. On this scope, you can actually put markers on here, or what they call cursors, that you can mark one spot and then slide it over and mark another spot. And you can actually measure the distance between those two, but it gives it to you in time rather than wavelength. Okay, you so can, then you could calculate You it. could calculate it out so, from that. So you must have knew. I was actually just about to ask you if you could measure the wavelength with this. That's funny how that happened, isn't it? It is. <laughs> now, what happens if we increase the frequency of this tone here? Let's go on up a little bit. You can see the higher we go in frequency, the closer these waves are getting together. Yeah. That means the wavelength is, is getting shorter as frequency increases, which is exactly what we learned earlier. As these get higher, we're not actually picking them up on our little test speaker here very well. My ears are. Volume. <laughs> but we can see they just, as frequency goes up, they just keep getting closer and closer together. Here's 20,000 hertz right here. Wow, I can't even hear it. Yep. So that's an audio signal right there. See, it's a, it's a sine wave. So I'll tell you what, let's, let's look at some RF now. So I'll unhook the audio oscillator. Well, we'll bring out the handy talkie here. I'll have to reset the scope up so that uh, it's looking at the right thing. I got a little rubber duck attached to it there. You don't see that every day? No, you don't. As a matter of fact, I think it's probably the first time I've ever done it. Oh, yeah? So, yeah. So let's look at some RF now. We've got the handy talkie here on two meters. We'll key up 
There's RF we're seeing right there on the screen as I get closer sure to the antenna. Is. Yeah, you gotta get pretty close for it to pick yeah. it up. So it's it's just like a solid bar though. If we start increasing on the horizontal here on the scope, we'll see that it finally turns into waves. Once I get out as oh. far as I can, you can see the waves there. This looks just like audio, doesn't it? It sure does. It's just a much higher frequency and a much shorter wavelength. Mm -hmm. All right, let's, that's VHF. Let's go up to UHF and just take a look at it. Oh. There's a UHF signal right there. We'll have to increase the gain on the scope to be able to see it. You notice there's, there's a lot more waves here. Sure They're a lot is. closer together. Yeah, it's a lot, it's a lot weaker. Yeah. Now, the reason for that, this scope is limited to 100 megahertz, which is a good scope. Uh -huh. But we're trying to look at 440 megahertz with it, so it's it's, it's out of something. band. Yeah, so you're just kind of getting basically it over yeah. overloading it. Overloading it, you're getting and a little bit in it. Two meters actually was the same way. Uh, two meters is actually it's out of band as well. It is, but it can still measure it. And if uh -huh. you notice, when I get real close to it, it goes to clipping. Yeah. Uh, it's just because we're overloading it, but uh, there you go. So essentially, what we've discovered there is an audio uh, waveform and an RF waveform from this handy talkie look exactly the same. Yeah, just just the wavelength is yep, a little bit different. The wavelength or frequency is is just a little different between the two. Yeah, that's pretty in pretty interesting. Pretty interesting. Now we didn't look at modulation. We'll look at that one day. We'll we'll. Talk about modulation. Yeah, I think that's so. going to be an, uh, an upcoming topic for uh, the history lesson, and then we'll probably have a project that goes along with it, I'm sure. Yep. And we actually did talk about modulation a little later. Maybe we'll, uh, maybe we'll bring that on here one day. It was pretty interesting. Well, you know, last week I had a question that came from Gordo's Extra Class Amateur Radio Guide that, uh, well, it, it could be considered a little bit of a toughie here. Well, it's in the extra pool, so what is the current in a primary winding of a transformer called if no load is attached to the secondary? Is it magnetizing current, direct current, excitation current, or stabilizing current? Well, I had an answer to that. And it's from Brad Mishkeman, N5LUL. And he said, George, the correct answer is magnifying current. Uh, from an ARRL handbook under the chapter Electric Laws and Circuits, under the subheading Effects of Secondary Currents, it reads, the current that flows in the primary when no load is taken from the secondary is called the magnetizing current of the transformer. Well, congratulations, Brad. Uh, we've got something special for you. MFJ is going to hook you up with an MFJ 2703 three-way wideband antenna switch. This thing's good out to a uh, couple of gigahertz. So um, a great switch, actually 1.5 gigahertz, just a gigahertz and a half. But, uh, you know, what's that among friends? It's a great antenna switch, very heavy duty, can handle up to two kilowatts. I use these myself. Thanks for that, MFJ. Uh, congratulations, Brad. Got another question for next week. And I guess we're going to give away another one of Gordo's books. You know, I like, um, I like giving away Gordo's books pretty good bit because he's usually not here at this time during the show. And I can get away with this just fine. Uh, you can enter for this. Uh, you get a, well, whoever wins can take their choice of a technician, a general extra class, or the general radio operator's license book. Answer this for me. What is the formula to convert frequency to wavelength? If you think you know the answer to that, send it to me at hamnationcontest at gmail.com. What is the formula to convert frequency to wavelength? And you could win one of Gordo's books. Okay, I would say at this point, 
Uh, gee, I think uh, Val is here, and she's got another great interview. This is the reason I'm wearing this shirt tonight is because the, the guy we're going to talk with now sent it to me. And he's been doing some great work down in Houston. Yes, he has, George. Um, and we're talking about Kilo Echo Zero Alpha Yankee Japan. Andy, you guys probably see him in the chat room all the time. He's very active in the chat room. Well, I was stumbling through my uh, Facebook social media and I was reading what he was doing, Andy, and uh, I just had to get him on the show because it really shows the spirit of ham radio. It doesn't have that much to do with ham radio, but it shows the spirit of ham radio operators and what giving people they are. So um, I'm going to let him tell you a little bit about what he's been doing uh, for his part with the Hurricane Harvey victims um, of the flooding and the hurricane down in uh, Texas. And he's from Indiana. So, Andy, welcome aboard. Oh, thanks. Thanks, Val. Uh, hopefully the bandwidth holds out for us and everything. I've been down here in Texas for about five days now. Um, it's uh, something terrible. I don't, uh, I don't think they could ever plan for anything like this. It's, uh, it's just phenomenal, all the amount of water that is everywhere. Uh, we started uh, off down here, just myself and a, and a friend of mine started off down here. And uh, he had to go back because of a medical emergency in his family. So I took over uh, taking care of dogs down here and uh, bringing them in and had a bunch of volunteers show up up at Livingston, uh, Livingston, Texas, which is just a little bit northeast of uh, Houston. Uh, we well, were in there. And you should really you should really tell them about. I mean, this isn't even your farm. You found a farm. You set it all up. You got all the stuff to make dog pens. I mean, you did a lot of work out of nothing right well yeah we pretty much did that i i uh i i put the whole bill for it right now so i'm in the hole so so to speak uh on that kind of stuff but it was uh it was for the dogs and get the animals out and get them safe things like that um but we had volunteers show up and they helped a lot we got uh, 109 dogs rescued and six cats uh got 39 dogs reclaimed and we sent nine dogs up to Dallas, and the rest went into shelters uh, up in the Dallas area and further north, up in Arkansas and whatnot. But uh, uh, we did it ourselves, and we were very proud of it. I had an excellent group of people here in this local area that just showed up, uh, found out what I was doing. They, they, they were sort of quizzing me as to why did this stranger show up with all these antennas all over this camper, and does he just think he's going to squat here or what? And uh, we started building stuff. I uh, brought in 4,000 pounds of dog food, um, wood, kennels, everything. And we found a barn and went and talked to the family that owned the old barn. And it was an old couple. And they made food for us and uh, used the barn for whatever you want, they said. And we did. And uh, we got uh, 109 dogs out of here with that. So uh, I was down here uh, yesterday and I thought, well, okay, we're pretty much finished and everything. Going to be done with it. I'm going to start heading back home. And I started heading north, and uh, I was listening on Zillow, and uh, it just didn't sound good. Uh, Orange was getting hit. Beaumont was getting hit. Vidor was getting hit. Uh, and this is going on right now. And I said, I can't leave. And I turned around, and, and I'm sitting for when two cousins are coming in from Georgia, one with a 45-foot uh, fifth-wheel trailer that uh, can transport animals. Uh, bring it a 35 foot uh, uh, what they call a uh, Boston whaler down and I bought, bought a 2 kW Honda generator we're going to put in there for the night vision stuff so we can see where we're going and we're going to stay down here for a few more days and see if we can help those folks out there and then I'll head back up north the funds are getting a little low so I dipped into my 7610 savings and uh, I'll have to wait another year or two for that but they'll make more so, I mean, you did this all on your own. You just got in your car, drove down, found a farm. They let you build pens in there. And uh, I know you went back and forth. How many times did it take you to go back and forth to get the 109 dogs? And, and those aren't easy trips because I've been listening on Zello as well. And I'll tell you guys all about Zello when we're done here. But um, it, the, everything's closed. Roads are closed. It's unsafe. And I mean, that it, just each trip alone, I, I bet you're running on fumes right now. 
<laughs> well, I, I myself am, yeah. That and massive doses of caffeine. Uh, I'm probably, uh, uh, Juan Valdez and, and his donkey are probably going crazy down there uh, harvesting for me right now. Um, yeah, a lot of trips up and down the road. I had to travel nine miles down the road. I had a rental vehicle, four-wheel drive, uh, a large panel van. Uh, I rented that to uh, transport those uh, animals from down where the boats could bring them to us. And they were just showing up. They knew what we were there for and everything. They were just showing up and dropping off dogs and, and cats. And I said, I can't take cattle because I don't have feed for them, don't have any place to put them, no way to round them up or anything like that. So, But they uh, found out we were there, and here they come, boat after boat after boat, back and forth. And I finally had to sit down and relax and say, okay, uh, I had a friend of mine here, Carl, I met, a real nice young man. He drove the van back and forth umpteen trips and he was here for like 30 i think about 32 hours straight just helping out and, uh, and, and i just you had some pay. vets volunteer as well so they could give uh all the dogs any shots they needed to be transported and things like that as well right yeah we hooked up with uh a fellow named Ch uh chad from i think he was from biloxi and he was up in the dallas area and he had a sign out by the highway that he was trying to get into houston to assist and uh, he's a retired vet and he had boxes there and I'm going, okay, this didn't look right. So I pulled out and I said, are you really a vet? And I told him when I was going planting, he says, I'm with you. So we loaded him up and then, of course, the dogs and my canines had to get used to him again. Uh, but we loaded and him up and he showed up with all his medical, medical supplies and vaccinations and certificates for transport. And uh, where we went. So we were fully much uh, self-contained. And those fellows that were running Aries on the 40 and 80 meter nets around here, they really provided the biggest service to us and telling us what weather was coming in and whatnot, things like that. Uh, you know, Zello was, was there for most of the information. And on Facebook, that was where most of the communication was taking place. D-Star, they were passing a lot of local information back and forth. But like you said, it wasn't a ham event down here. This was a rescue and that's what I uh, that's what I approached it as, just simply as a rescue. I didn't even get and on I the radio. Thank you. You sent us a video also of um, a few, three very happy uh, pe dogs that were rescued. If you want to go ahead and show the, uh, yeah, how cute. They're in, the, and that's at the farm that you they let you use. Is that correct? Yeah, that's a temporary fence we strung up and bolted together and everything, and put feeders in it and stuff. Those three dog houses we drug out of the barn. And threw in there and uh, cleaned out all the weeds in it and strung that fence up. And that's the barn back there in the background that we used. Um, uh, for put the, put the kennels in. When I come up, I want to take a video of that. But they had already locked it up because we were cleaning up and getting out of there. These are the three dogs. There were four in there and one escaped. And I think they found out that it was a local dog. He just came up to visit maybe. But uh, these guys didn't have tags on them or anything. And there's a brother and sister. And that's the black and white one. I thinking they're pretty much brother and sister and the gold one i don't know where that came from but with those blue eyes i'm thinking it's it's somewhere in a husky range out there and the, and those are at the dallas rescues right and because i know when they're they want to keep them in the state keep them close by for when people try to claim them and they're trying to put together a database i've been listening a lot on zello and um so it's going to be a lot of work a lot of work yet to come and uh i know i'm going to let you go uh, because well hi, hey how I know you said you're doing this out of your own pocket, so you didn't get any outside donations for this at all. Is that right? Is that correct? No, I didn't get. No, I just had. To, I knew I had to do it. I just felt I had to do it. You know, it was. Uh, those are dogs, and, and those are family members to people. So you know, you well, got to do that. Your Bless your heart for that, and uh, that's just wonderful. Um, I know a lot of us can't afford to do. I mean, how, you're probably out. What? How, how many thousand dollars are you out for all those pens and uh, dog food? I don't know. I'm probably about sixty five hundred in the hole right now. Oh, that's so. Well, bless your heart for that, and uh, you really do have a great heart. And just as a lot of our ham friends and especially ham nation viewers and we really do appreciate all that you're doing and i know you're heading back down into ground zero and uh, godspeed i know there's a lot of three boaters lost it today and um so you just be care very careful um and uh all the best and just wonderful things that you're doing andy we really do appreciate it well thanks thanks for having me in there and thanks for spreading the word for us We'll talk to you And I'll later. be listening to you on Great. Zello and keeping track of you. So making sure you're uh, safe. Uh, sounds good. Thank right. you. 
And um, for those of you that don't know, Zello is, um, since there is internet, they're not really using any other um, ham radio frequencies or anything. But Zello is just an app you can get on your phone. You can get it on your iPhone or iOS, uh, Droid. You can also put it up on your PC. And um, let me turn it on here and you can kind of hear. Them from so we can link them back up after this is all over. But there is definitely um, spaces. It's just a matter of finding them. Katie, that Bass Pro Shop seems like. So like they're talking about, a, you know, this one is an animal rescue, Harvey Animal Rescue. Uh, I also was listening to Port Arthur uh, Harvey Rescue. That's a people rescue. There's all kinds of rescue channels on here. Uh, there's a channel on here that's telling you what roads are open. It's just going to help you out if you need to get directions. And it's an app. It's a walkie-talkie app. And it's free. And it's internet-based. So it's very addicting. I warn you, and it's very sad when you hear them go to rescue horses and some of them didn't make it and things like that. But um, uh, and, and even from Illinois, I'm not down there. I'm doing my part. I'm keeping a spreadsheet of which dr which drivers with horse trailers are where, which boats are where here, um, where the rescues need to be, and as they're ticked off, and you know, and so I'm helping them with dispatch. Um, so even from far away, if you don't have five thousand dollars to spend, I mean, and and that's truly generous of Andy, um, you could kind of do your part to help out um, on some on, on Zello. There's so many channels of rescue channels down here um, and everybody needs help and it's kind of chaotic, especially down in the uh, Beaumont, uh, Port Arthur, uh, Orange area. Uh, a lot of uh, people and animals and livestock and everything needs help down there. So um, just thought I'd lay that out there for if you wanna download that app. Also, um, Andy kind of inspired me to do this. I created a Facebook page called Hams Helping Hams. It's a Facebook group. It's called Hams Helping Hams. Now, 80% of the residents down there do not have flood insurance. So this problem is not gonna go away once the water subsides. Uh, this is gonna be a major problem. And any hams out there down in five land do not feel too proud to ask for help. A lot of us want to help. We want to help. And um, so hopefully you'll join this page. If you need some muscle to come tear your drywall down and things like that, once you get back in your house, post it on here. And I bet you'll get a lot of volunteers because that's what we do. We're all very giving people. And if you want to help, join this group and spread the word to all your other ham friends. And it doesn't have to be just for the hurricane. Um, if there's an elderly gentleman that needs help with the antenna or something like that, you can post that on here too. So I just wanted to create a, uh, a group, uh, a, ham, a Facebook group called Hams Helping Ham. So just put that in your search bar on Facebook and uh, you'll be asked to join, you'll be asked to give your call sign. I'm just gonna make sure only hams are in there because people might be giving out addresses and phone numbers and sensitive information. So I just want to kind of limit the group to ham. So, and uh, also you can do your part, like they said, Red Cross, uh, Salvation Army, some Meriden's Purse is another good one. Another good thing to do is just find an area down there that's been hit hard and uh, find a local church and donate directly to that local church because 100% of that money is going to go to the people. There's no salaries and there's no advertising and, and things like that. So, um, those are just different ways you can help do your part to help all these people down there. So that's all I've got for tonight. So I'm going to pass it over to you, Amanda. Thank you, Valerie. And uh, boy, Andy just tugged at the at the heartstrings. So thanks, Andy. You do a good job. Um, that being said, uh, I can't be I can't keep it together much more than that because he was so cute and so nice and we love all of those animals and I can't imagine losing my animals in a flood or anything else. So I'm gonna go over some nets where they're already talking about all of this and I think it's awesome. The one thing I do have, Val, is a lot of people have been asking on chat, is there any way we can help Andy with any of his expenses that he's incurred? Did he start like maybe a GoFundMe page you or know, I was is there some I was talking to him about that. He is just so busy right now to set up a GoFundMe, but he does have a PayPal because we wanted to send him some money. So I get, I did get his PayPal uh, address. For those of you who want it, I'll give it to you here. I'll also put it on the Hams Helping Ham page, uh, Hams Helping Hams. Um, and it, his PayPal address, if you want to just send him some money via PayPal, it's uh, Kilo Echo Zero Alpha Yankee Japan 
at gmail.com. And uh, you can PayPal that email address and help him back because we, Jerry and I feel really bad and we want to help him as well. So yeah, I'll put it in the chat room here too. So um, awesome. hopefully that'll help. That's, that's yep. great. And uh, go ahead, Don. It's like Andy just posted it. So uh, thank you, Andy. Who knew that, who knew that, that uh, the face of an angel tonight would be in the form of of Andy uh, in a dark uh, room with a canine hat on, but uh, Andy, you're truly an angel. You're a good friend to all of us, and uh, you're doing you're doing God's work, and we love you. And for he was it. a dog trainer, so he was a dog yeah. trainer by trade. He supposedly is retired and enjoying his retirement, but this is how he's enjoying it. Yeah. Just, oh, just amazing. He's, he's, he is amazing. And I know he, he loves German Shepherds because I see his Facebook piece, fo- posts all the time. And uh, I'm going to hit him up for some for some helpers with my German Shepherd mix there. But anyhow, I know you guys, we have to wrap this up, but it's um, let us be humbled tonight. And yes. Don, of all people, Don, why don't you tell us, I know that this is really hard for you. One, just one more thing for you. How did you feel when you had to escape with um, Don and Tyler on well, during was, Katrina? It, it was scary. I mean, we, we evacuated the morning. We evacuated, uh, I can't remember now, but I think, I think that Katrina hit like uh, on a Monday morning early and we, we evacuated, we got out on Sunday morning. Um, and we got out, and it wasn't just the three of us. It was immediate family. We had uh, three, I think, three or four hotel rooms in this hotel in North Little Rock, where we stayed for for two weeks. And if you're if you're in the area where there are refugees, um, evacuees, or as as uh, as Jeff put it, guests, and you encounter them, by all means. Um, Random acts of kindness are greatly appreciated. Um, once the churches found out that we had a five-year-old, I mean, they were over every day with food, <laughs> with money, with toys, and I'm getting choked up thinking about it. But um, one thing that happened to us that was was um, particularly touching is um, uh, the three of us, my, Don, Tyler, and me, and again, he was five, um, kindergartner. Um, we were in a Target I believe it was in Little Rock. And we were just, I think we had like $20 worth of stuff in our basket. We had a small ice chest and I think a toy for him and and I don't know, something else, some, I don't know, bag of chips or something and maybe a Coke. And I think it's what we had. But it was like 20, 25 bucks or whatever. And we're just standing around in line, just, just talking casually, not talking about anything specifically and certainly not talking about the storm. But, you know, my wife has a very distinct accent, South Louisiana accent. And the person in front of us heard her speak and turned around and, and said, I'm sorry, I don't mean to pry, but are you guys here from New Orleans? And we said, yes, we are. And they said, are, did you evacuate from the hurricane? We said, yes, we did. And, and sh- this person said, I'd like to buy everything in your basket. Oh. And what do you say? But thank you. So if you can, if you can pass that on, by all means, do it. And I think with that, um, (laughs) before we all turn into blubbering idiots, we should uh, just close and say goodnight. And God bless Texas. And thank you all for being here on Ham Nation. Absolutely. God bless Texas, you guys. Thank you, Don.